morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Ibu Grace uh, Chen uh, from the University of Saint Malaya. Is it Malaysia? Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, giving your time uh, to deliver a session in our campus, uh, in the Faculty of Humanities, because I know that at the moment actually you are very busy with your own research and everything. Okay, and uh, Ibu Grace uh, Chen is a senior lecturer uh, in the English in the English Language and Literature Studies School of Humanities, University Saints Malaysia, and uh, she is here actually for conducting uh, her research for collecting data in Indonesia, and she is very generous in accepting our request to deliver a session in our faculty. So, without further ado, let's welcome Ibu Grace. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming from, uh, to my talk and also I would like to thank Dr. Cecilia Halimi for inviting me here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be you know, in Dui and uh, I just learned that's how it's pronounced this morning. You have a beautiful campus and I'm very excited to share with you my research on uh, Princess Hang Li Po. Uh, this particular talk is based on a chapter from a volume of essays that I recently edited and it's called Translational Politics. Contesting Race, Gender and Sexuality in Southeast Asian Literature. And the chapter is, is titled Performance and Translation, Hang Li Po and the Politics of History. In particular, I look at how Hang Li Po uh, is appropriated and revised in the post-colonial narratives of Malaysia and how she's used for certain ideological purposes, even in theatre and performance. Okay? So I'm just wondering how many of you are in comparative literature? Uh, any of you from comparative literature or theatre studies or anything like that? Alright, um, even then, we'll, I hope that you'll find this talk uh, in illuminating or interesting. So, uh, I'd just like to go to a little bit of history. In 2012, a uh, Malaysian uh, historian, uh, Professor Ku Kim, oh, sorry. Alright, so that's him, yeah? Uh, Professor Ku. And he basically made this huge claim that you know, uh, Princess Hang Li Po was then considered a historical figure in our history textbook, uh, together with figures like Hang Tua, Hang Jebat, and, and his uh, warrior brothers. Um, so he said that no, they don't exist at all. Right? They are myths and legends. And he caused a, 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 a kind of a public controversy actually in Malaysia when he said that. And at that time, our Malaysian uh, school textbooks actually claimed that uh, Hang Li Po was Sultan Mansur Shah's fifth wife during his reign in Malacca from 1456 to 1477. And this is the time when you know you have the uh, Hang Tua. You, do you know the Malay warrior Hang Tua, right? And his brothers in arms, Hang Jebat, Hang Le Kiu, Hang Le Kiu, and Hang Kasturi. And, and they were all, you know, uh, considered as historical figures. And this is actually an image from the textbook and this is about Hang Tua, how he's a laksamana, an admiral, and he's uh, loyal, and he's brave, and he's, he's very smart. So, um, now, what is interesting about Ku's revelation is that it reveals the troubling ways in which fact and fiction are interwoven in the telling of Malaysian history. And it also brings, you know, into the sharper relief, the main purpose of history education, which is to build national identity and to instill a sense of patriotism among the students of Malaysia. All right? and, uh, but here's the thing about Hang Li Po and the way that she's being revised in the national curriculum. Because I believe that you know, how she's reinterpreted uh, bears certain um, implications for Chinese-Malay relations and for Malaysian-Chinese identity in the nation space. So um, my contention today actually, is to examine how this legendary figure all right, uh, is been reinterpreted and translated in the national imaginary and what they reveal in terms of race and gender relations in the multilingual and globalizing landscape of post-colonial Malaysia from the 1980s till the late 1990s, right? 
So since the 1960s, the Malaysian fascination with Hang Lipo has consistently manifested itself in theatre and performance, two of which will be analysed here. A Malay language uh, Bangsawan play called Putri Lipo, right, and is actually uh, written by Rama Bujang and performed in 1982. The script itself was published in 1992. And then we have a multilingual monodrama uh, titled Hang Lipo, Malaccan Princess by Anne Lee, which was performed in 1998 and published in two, uh, 2011. Now, what I find interesting is that these plays, or rather my analysis of these plays, will show that you know, they actually tap into these local and global ideologies and discourses of identity. And they will also show that there is an ongoing preoccupation with the uh, idea of Malaysia as a nation and also what it means to be Malaysian. So in analyzing the representational uh, politics of identity in both plays, I consider also the importance of genre because drama and performance engage the visual and auditory languages of body and performance, the process of which not only involves the interaction between actors and dramatic texts and words, but also between actors and audiences. So the multilingual, multi-textual, and multi-layered world of performance, all right, in fact shows the ways in which the text building of the popular legend of Hang Li Po emerges from the translation and what Lindsay 2006 calls the rich interplay between music, uh, music, I mean, sorry, words, music, and movement. And this approach is developed from the tradition of performance translation. So using this approach, I look at how translation takes place not only between multiple language structures, both verbal and nonverbal, operating within the genre itself, but also at the level of the dialogue or text, at the level of performance, you know, your bodily action and your facial expressions, as well as music and the interactions with the audience. So by drawing out these relationships between body and text, I can consider the kinds of symbolic meanings and implicit messages that emerge from the processes of appropriating and revisioning the legend, particularly those involving the textual and performative engagements with the ideological discourses of language, race, and gender. Only then we can see how translation, or rather the lack of it, becomes a political act of performing and articulating identity and what it reveals about the politics of history, especially in the context of modernizing religion. So before I go to the analysis, I have to give you a little bit of background about Princess Hamid. So the origins of this legend actually came from a very old text uh, called Sejarah Melayu. Do you know about Sejarah Melayu? Right? Uh, it's very famous, right, in the uh, Malay world, right? And it is um, called the uh, because it's Malay Annals, and it's a historical manuscript that was written sometime between the 15th and 17th centuries. So the the actual date is not really known. Um, but what we do know is that it chronicles Malacca's rights as a powerful sultanate and strategic trading post, right? And, uh, and also its eventual fall at the hands of the Portuguese in 1511. Now, it consists of court narratives. And it was commissioned, the, the manuscript was commissioned by a minor Malay ruler called Raja Bangsu, Bangsu from Johor. And uh, apparently he, he, he did so to exalt and preserve the glorious history of Malay royalty and, and I quote Chia 2010, uh, semi-divine genealogical links to Palembang, India, Persia, and Alexander the Great, end quote. So it was uh, originally penned in Jawi, right, and titled as Sulalatu Salatin, which means the genealogy of sultans. And the authorship has been disputed by scholars, so we don't really know who actually wrote it. Yeah? There's some people saying it's Kun Sri Lana, and others saying otherwise. So what uh, scholars and historians uh, do agree on is that you know, the, the, the manuscript has been praised for the seamless ways in which it brings together the different elements of historicity, fiction, and imagination. Now, while the historicity of Sejarah Malayu is in doubt, it has nonetheless been hailed by historians and scholars as a Malay literary masterpiece. So the text has since been translated into um, English and Malay, and there are at least 32 editions in libraries across the world, but with all the various recensions, editions, and translations, there are some inconsistencies uh, you know, between the uh, different editions. So 
uh, where how many people is concerned the story is pretty similar. It goes thus, you know, the, 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 the Chinese emperor, right, the Ming Dynasty, was so impressed of uh, with the luckless greatness and power at the time that he decided to marry his daughter, Han Bibo, to the then ruling Sultan Mansur Shah. So the princess sailed with her ladies in waiting and 500 youths of noble birth to Malacca, where you know they were all received with great pomp and ceremony. And um, the Sultan was, by all accounts, you know, greatly astonished by her uh, amazing beauty. And um, after conversion to Islam, she married him. And from the uh, union, an illustrious line of descendants was established. So uh, the, the Sultan was uh, was like um, so pleased with the union that he also decided to give uh, you know uh, Hanlipo and the followers a place of their own, which is called Bukit China. And until today, there is still this place called Bukit China in Malacca. All right. And since then, okay, I mean since the uh, 15th century, both Bukit China and Malacca have been recognized as the birthplace of localized Chinese roots, not notably represented by the Peranakan Chinese. All right, this is them. Okay, also known as the Baba Nyonya in Malacca. All right, and you can also find them in Penang and in Singapore now. Uh, and the community, of course, should be distinguished from the later Chinese immigrants that arrived in the late 19th and, and early 20th centuries. Right? They are known as the new immigrants. These are acculturated. Right? They, they blend Malay Chinese uh, traditions and, and values. So today, we have Bukit China here, right? and there's a popular tourist stop. Uh, and Bukit China actually houses the biggest uh, Chinese cemetery outside of China. Okay, And then we also have Hang Lipo's well, this is the well that is attributed to her. Apparently she drank from it, she and her followers drank from it. But uh, it also has been um, named uh, King's Well. Again, it is one of the popular tourist uh, stops or attractions in Malacca. Now, uh, according to Abu Talib Ahmad 2014, Hang Lipo was also displayed as the Sultan's consort in the Malacca Histor uh, History and Ethnography Museum, which provides details of arrival and even a diorama of a residence at Bukit China. However, this kind of display would have you know, also heightened the confusion surrounding the historicity of the princess. Now, what's interesting here is the way the legend has been used to reinforce the narrative of Malay superiority and dominance. Because China in the 15th century was an, uh, an unrivaled powerhouse in the region, and the Ming Emperor undoubtedly held the upper hand in the political alliance with Malacca. Now, the story to an extent reflects this you know, kind of power hierarchy when the Emperor marries his only daughter to you know, uh, the Malacca Sultan because only then he can exact obeisance from the Sultan. However, what comes next in the story completely inverts the power relations between Malacca and China and confers superiority to the Sultan. In Sejar Malayu, the Sultan's obeisance to the Emperor has an unexpected side effect. The latter immediately contracts a skin disease called plasma and is spread all over his body and he can't get rid of it. And the only cure is to drink and bathe in the water used by the Sultan to wash his feet. So basically he has to drink and bathe in the Sultan's feet washing water in order to be cured of the skin disease. And once he was healed, the Emperor takes a oath to never again demand obeisance from the Sultan or those that come after him, but only friendship on equal terms. So they become equals, right? So there is that, that kind of reversal of power relations here. So, Hang Lipo's story reinforces the Sultan's supremacy and elevates his status to the point where he is acknowledged as equal to the emperor. So in this case, her story is basically, well, she doesn't do very much, right? She's just an object of exchange. And her value as a Chinese princess and as a woman is significantly reduced because, you know, not only she, she's, you know, her only function is just to get the equality. And also, the legend never, you know, we never hear her speak or, you know, uh, or, or do anything or, or, or anything remarkable in the story itself. So, her enduring image has always been one of marginality, one of silence and submission. Now, what's interesting is that there is no record whatsoever in, as I said, in the Malaysian historical records or even in the Ming Dynasty imperial annals, according to Wei, 1997. He, uh, he says that you know, Hang Lipo cannot be found anywhere. You know, she is not um, recognized as a Chinese princess. There is no such marriage to the Sultan. So 
That's why Professor Ku came up with a claim that you know she never existed. So the story of revised China-Malacca relations in uh, Sejarah Melayu therefore reflects a certain competing narrative at work in the reshaping of Malay and later Malaysian identity and history. And this representation of a marginalized and subservient Chinese princess can be said to reflect, I argue, the beleaguered position and identity of the Malaysian Chinese in the post-independence age when they were redefined as non-Bumi Putra, Bumi Putra meaning the sons of the soil, Right? and uh, therefore they are non-indigenous, they are foreign and other. So it is this representation that was promoted by the Malaysian official discourse when Hang Liko was historicized and produced as fact in the national history syllabus. Now to understand how this representation came about, I have to provide some context about the ethnic relations all right, uh, in Malaysia. So how many of you have visited Malaysia? Yeah. Right, so you know that Malaysia is a multicultural, multiracial country, right? It's a, it has this plural population, right? And um, well, it is a plural society, it's a, um, and it consists of this polyglossy. You hear all kinds of languages, right? You hear Malay, you hear English. Uh, there's also Chinese and also Tamil. We have polyglossy community, and uh, we have different ethnicities, religions, and cultures, right? Uh, according to the demographic uh, statistics, the Malays form the majority at 50.1%, followed by the Chinese at 22.6%, the Indians at 6.7%, and non-Malay indigenous minority groups at 11.8%. Now, prior to the uh, to independence in 1957, a bargain was struck between the Malays and the immigrant communities of the Chinese and the Indians, uh, in that the special rights and positions of the Malays would be protected. Uh, and the non-Malays would be given the just the right of citizenship by birth. And then came the tragedy of May 13, 1969. The race riots broke out as a result of escalating communal tensions, primarily between the Malays and the Chinese. Now, May 13 radically reshaped the ethno-linguistic and social relations in the country, starting with the implementation of pro-Malay policies in the early 1970s. The most important of which uh, were the new economic policy, NEP, and the national education policy. Now, the NEP focused on advancing the Malays economically to the point where they could be on par with the more affluent Chinese, while the education policy established Malay language as the exclusive medium of instruction across national schools and universities. So this policy also reinforced the role of Malay as the national language of Bahasa Malaysia. So at the same time, non-Malay languages like English and the mother tongues of the Chinese and Indians were relegated to secondary status. Literatures written in non-Malay languages were similarly affected and they were dismissed as sectional or communal literatures. Only Malay language literature was given national status. So at the same time, the Malays affirmed their status as Muniputra and to prevent seditious comments on their status, and on the status of the Malay language and on the Malay monarchy, the government used existing draconian laws inherited from the British, who was once a British colony, and also implemented new repressive measures to place further limits on speech, publishing, movement, and assembly. So the post-1969 generations have grown up with this divisive politics, and they have effectively fragmented the imagined community of the nation along the lines of race, language, and religion because the Malay is also a Muslim under the constitution. So until today, the contentious polemics of Malay and non-Malay still dominate the socio-political and uh, reality of Malaysia. Now, Sejara so Melayu is important to the revised national narrative of post-colonial Malaysia, all right, which, as I mentioned, is an ex-British colony, and is decolonizing objectives in two vital ways. Right. And firstly, it expresses the indigenous viewpoint, right? It is reclaiming you know, their identity, their position, right? In, in, in forming a, a new independent and sovereign Malaysia. And secondly, it perpetuates a specific vision okay, of Malaysia as a post-colonial sovereign nation. And it does so by sanctioning the authority and privileged position of the Malay Bukit Putra as the indigenous people. However, according to Chia 2010, Sejarah Melayu fulfilled this ideological purpose in preserving the traditional ideal uh, form of government, Kerajaan, right? And I quote, the traditional golden age with its own concepts, beliefs, images, system of politics, as well as cherished, uh, as well as, so sorry, uh, 
uh, laws and social behavior. Right? And this traditional golden age is based on Islamic principles of morality and justice, as well as cherished Malay values like loyalty and deference to the elderly and those of authority. However, it is also through Sejara Melayu that Malacca has been validated according to what Warden in 20, uh, 2001 said, the center of the Malay world. All right. So this center of the Malay world is represented by the Malaccan Palace, which has been rebuilt um, some decades ago, and is still and is one of the uh, tourist attractions today in Malacca. This is what the uh, traditional Malaccan uh, palace would have looked like. Um, and this representation has been appropriated by the Malaysian government to support the authority and authenticity of its current public history. So as the symbolic site where the pre-colonial Malay government and Islamic traditions have flourished, Malacca was reinvented by the Malaysian government as the, and I quote Warden, national birthplace where the nationalist movement began. However, this rhetoric also leaves little doubt that the national history and public memory being reconstructed here is one that upholds the representation of the late Islamic masculinity as a source of nationalist authority. Historically embodied by the Malaccan sultans, this lineage has been maintained by the royal houses of Malaysia today. The vision of a glorious Malay past has been used to defend the state's construction of a monocultural, monolingual, and Islamic Malay Malaysia rather than a multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multi-religious Malaysian Malaysia, especially in the 1970s and 1980s. So by historicizing the legendary figure of Hang Di Ho in the formation of national discourse and history, the state also reveals the subordination of the Chinese as gendered and racialized other. An image that plays a central role not only in the shaping of Chinese Malay relations, but also of Malaysian Chinese identity and place in the revised narratives of the nation. Now, this can be seen throughout the 1970s and 1980s, when the government pursued an ethnocentric monocultural agenda that promoted Malay language and uh, indigenous, largely Malay symbols in the development of national culture, despite calls for the adoption of more liberal policy that would better reflect Malaysia's rich cultural diversity. So as the forces of Malayization and Islamization swept across the country in the 1970s, Chinese heritage and cultural sites began to be neglected and even excluded from national representations of history. For instance, the lion dance, the Chinese cultural symbol, was said to be foreign, or it was denounced as foreign, by the then Home Affairs Minister, and was rejected from inclusion into national culture. Even Bukit China, long associated with localized Chinese roots, was gazetted for redevelopment in 1984 by the state government. So fierce opposition uh, saved Bukit uh, China from its fate. But the general perception that there was an ongoing direct assault on Chinese cultural heritage prevailed. So heightened ethnic tensions and the erosion of non-Malay rights and identities also led to record numbers of Malaysian Chinese migrating overseas between 1983 and 1990, so throughout the 1980s really. Now, then came a shift in the government's stance towards ethnic relations, particularly from the late 1980s onwards. And this was because of the economic needs, right? The needs of uh, development and modernization, and also because of the forces of globalization. So, by the late 1980s, 19, uh, early 1990s, there were certain promising signs okay, that could be seen. Uh, for one thing, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Uh, Mahathir Mohamad, who is also our Prime Minister now, he promised to end ethnic quotas by 2020. And then in 1991, the NDP was replaced by the National Development Policy, or the NDP, all right, and he relaxed pro-Malay quotas. Government restrictions were also lifted from the Chinese Lion Dance in the 1990s, the result of which, you know, you know plays like this, or performances like this, can be held across Malaysia uh, without any problems. Right? This is actually uh, held in Kuala Lumpur, in front of one of the hotels, I think. Um, so meanwhile, globalization and its attendant forces and flows of people, media, technology, capital and ideologies was restructuring the order of world economies and Malaysia wanted in on the action, right? It wanted to reshape its identity as a modern, international and progressive country that was open to foreign investment and trade relations. So in line with this objective, the government launched the Multimedia Super Corridor, the MSC project in 1996. 
under which a series of very important constructions, including the very iconic Petronas Twin Towers, you see here, right, the Twin Towers. And also you have Putrajaya, which is the seat of the Malaysian government today, right, and KLIA, right, Kuala Lumpur International Airport. So these very important constructions became the shining symbols of modern Malaysia. On top of that, there was the state recognition of English as a vital language of the global marketplace, communication and technology. And it led to the strengthening of English as a second language in the national curriculum. Now despite these promising signs, race and religious barriers remained enforced by draconian laws as well as prejudic uh, prejudicial uh, policies and practices that have been in place since the early 1970s. Now against the changing socio-political backdrop of uh, modernizing Malaysia from the 1970s to uh, 1980s to the 1990s, the story of Hang Lipo has been revisited, uh, revisited numerous times through drama and theatre with at least six performances that I could find. All right. They were held from 1960s till the 1980s. So the first one was Drama Tarian Hang, uh, Hang Lipo, right? performed in Malacca in the early 1960s, followed by Chen Luo Han's uh, musical theatre opera Lipo, uh, Hang Lipo, uh, performed in 1971 in Kuala Lumpur, and it was revived again in the early 1990s. And then we have Brahma's uh, Putri Lipo, the one I'll be analyzing, and it was performed in several states, so it was apparently very popular. Uh, during the 1980s and 1990s, and it was revised, uh, revised, oh, sorry, it should be revived in 1999 to commemorate revived, yes, to commemorate University Malaya's uh, 50th anniversary with the revised title Putri Chantiku Sayang uh, Sayang Lipo, my beautiful beloved Princess Lipo. And then we have Anne Lee's Hang Lipo, the second play that I'll be analyzing, uh, Malacan Princess. Performed in 1998 at the International Kuala Lumpur Monodrama Festival. And then there is the musical production by Istana Budaya, Putri Hang Lipo, performed in April 2004. And this one is quite interesting because it, uh, it actually has uh, the dual languages of Malay and Mandarin. It was performed in bilingual uh, Malay and Mandarin. And then we have the latest one, which is a dance drama, Hang Lipo, by Academy Seni Budaya Dan Warisan Tabang Saan, as well. Right, in 2015. And this time we also, it's quite different because it is about Hang Lipo accompanied by the Sultan and they return to Beijing for a visit. So the whole uh, play is set in Beijing and it showcases classic Chinese dances like this. And it can be seen as a recuperative effort to see the world from a Chinese uh, viewpoint. So as my analysis will show, the appropriative act of reimagining and translating the Chinese princess through drama and performance is also one that is influenced by socio-political developments occurring on the ground. Both plays engage with the complexities and contestations that underline the translational politics of identity as the nation state moved from a Malay nationalist, uh, nationalistic stance of the 1970s and the 1980s to a more moderate and international outlook in the 1990s. One that is influenced by global postmodernity and its economic benefits. <coughs> by responding to the hegemonic local and global discourses of their time, both plays also become the bearers of specific ideologies and as a result carry politically inflected objectives and nuances. Language is key to both plays, as is history, or rather the politics of history. Using the Chinese princess to query, to critique, provoke, subvert, or even to conform to and uphold ideologies and discourses. Both plays reveal what is at stake here, the idea of Malaysia as a nation, and what it means to be a Malaysian. However, both notions are neither simple nor clear, as the ideology behind them can be at odds with the material reality. Despite the divisive politics of race, religion, and language, Malaysians as a people have experienced some form of acculturation or hybridization because of the daily you know, interaction and, and social contact with each other. And you can see examples of this in our very rich food cultures, right? This, uh, if you go to Malaysia, one of the, things, the first things that you'll notice is the, the food culture. We've got everything from nasi lemak, roti canai, you know, to you know, siu pao or whatever. This, this kind of mix of Malay, Indian, and Chinese cuisine. And of course, we have our language, right? As which is, uh, I mentioned earlier, is multilingual. It's, it's very much, what we call the food called rojak, right? You know what rojak is, right? 
and mix like, different fruits and, and, and vegetables and, and mix it up with this delicious sauce. And that's what Malaysians are like, you know? We're all Rojak people. You know? We all mix with our language, you know, we, we, we switch from Malay to English to Chinese to, to Tamil, right? And this, uh, so in the sense that there's some, you know, on the ground, material practice-wise, we are acculturated. Furthermore, Saifu Anwar observed that the Malaysian Chinese were also influenced by transnational trends that hybridized them, and I quote, into a new cosmopolitan culture, especially among the middle class. Quote. He is actually referring to you know the influences from East Asia, Hong Kong, you know, uh, movies and, and, and the media at the time, right? And Taiwan and China now. So uh, these are the kinds of influences that also entered into the uh, consciousness and you know the imagining of the Malaysian Chinese. So what I want to say here basically is that the politics of identity and nation do not always cohere. And the ways in which they are interpreted and translated through drama and performance also reveal schisms through which social, cultural, and political ironies, incongruities, and disjunctions are highlighted. So with this in mind, let's now turn to the two points. So I'm going to start with Rahma's play, uh, really Lipo, which shall shorten to Pitri. Uh, and in many ways, this play falls within the national and historical framing of the race relations between Malay women Putra and Chinese non women Putra that had taken shape in the early 1970s and consolidated by the late uh, 1980s. Now, Putri was performed in the tradition of the Bangsawan. Do you know what the Bangsawan is? Do you have that here? It's a Malay opera. So it's actually, uh, according to Tan Sui Beng, she traced the roots of Bangsawan and she found that she, it was a 19th century popular and culturally syncretic opera form that blended multicultural musical elements and multilingual lyrics and dialogue for a multi-ethnic audience. However, by the 1980s, Wang Samwan has become a monolingual, monocultural form that predominantly showcased the Malay culture. Now, it was first staged in 1982, as I mentioned earlier, right? And Putri was so popular that it was um, revived again in 1999, as I told you. And the script was published in 1992. Now, here's the interesting bit. In 2000, it was incorporated into the national curriculum as one of the literary texts studied under the core compulsory subject of Bahasa Melayu at the secondary school level. So students who studied the play would have also watched the video of the staged performance of Putri on EduWeb TV, an online portal set up by the Ministry of Education that contains educational video and audio materials for students in both primary and secondary schools. So overall, Putri as a plot in terms of its plot line, that observes the, the plot line and themes of the story in Sejara Malay. The play opens with the princess already in Malacca, and it ends with the acceptance of a new identity in homeland. However, the character is also given voice, right, and some limited agency. And I, I, I told you earlier, you know, that Putri uh, Lipo didn't have any voice at all in the original legend. But here, Lipo is given emotional depth. She's lonely, she's homesick, she's unable to adapt to Malacca, and she is upset about her status as one of the co-wives in a polygamous marriage. And she also dreads her husband and is seen in a nightmare where her husband comes to her in the form of a jean afrit, right? Which is a wicked jean, right? And she tells us jean afrit, right? Or the sultan. One look at you and I lose my appetite. So Lipo later falls in love with one of Malacca's mightiest Malay warriors, Hang Jaba, who happens to be in love with one of her female attendants, Dang Wangi. When Lipo finds out the truth of their relationship, she feels shamed and angry. And in the end, she realizes that she has no choice. She basically has to accept her fate. So the imbalances in race and gender relations can be seen when the princess's limited agency, marginality, and powerlessness are juxtaposed against the sultan's masculinity and, uh, and superior power, uh, or it's called daulat, which is represented by four wives from powerful countries and empires, including Raden Galo of uh, Majapahit, and also, of course, Lipo of China. Now, throughout the play, Lipo and the audience are repeatedly reminded about the sultan's daulat, and that Malacca is blessed by his daulat. Raden Galo even cautions Lipo with the story of her own father who, stricken with illness as a result of the Malaccan Sultan's obeisance, had to be cured with water blessed by the Sultan's Dawlat. Now the play ends with a pregnant Lipo who finally accepts a new identity in place. 
Her final submission is seen in her willingness to wear clothes befitting a Malay princess, so Orang Putri Melayu, her mastery of Malay adat, as well as her desire to please her husband by sitting at his feet. So Lipo's submission is further heightened by the Sultan's masculine and sexual potency in the final scene. He is twice victorious because he conceived a son with her, and he has healed the emperor's the Chinese emperor's close mouth. So Putri therefore ends on a note of interracial unity and heterosexual harmony in which both race and gender hierarchies are maintained. In this way, the play also supports the Malay Islamic glory represented in Sejarah Melayu and whose vested Malay symbols uh, of, of power, the pre-colonial Malacan Kerajaan and the Sultan's Dawat, have since become part of the nation's foundation and historicized in the narration of post-independence Malaysia. Now according to Effendi and Rahma, in an article that they co-authored. The play's treatment of race and ethnicity raises, and I quote, the question of whether citizens of Chinese heritage should think of themselves as Chinese or Malaysian first, end quote. They also state, and I quote, people chooses loyalty to family and national unity in an adopted home. The general good and not her personal wishes must be served, end quote. However, this interpretation, while consistent with the socio-political climate and ideological prerogatives of the time, does not acknowledge what has been lost in translation, the erasure of Chinese racial and cultural heritage, which is seen when Li Po is transformed into a Malay princess at the end of the play. And we see here a scene from uh, Eddie Webb TV in which Li Po, in the end, this is her, you know, and she's, re uh, she's now accepted her fate, and she's dressed in the uh, clothing of the uh, Putri Malayu. Right? So she's transformed. So by suggesting that Chineseness, a foreign element, can only be accepted when it is fully assimilated into dominant Malay Muslim culture, the play also upholds the conservative stance on race relations, with the most desirable outcome being the natural assimilation of Malay's minority cultures into dominant Malay culture. In short, it is the Malayized and not Malaysianized Chinese who can be identified as part of the imagined community. Now, the play's refusal to accommodate difference in hybridity can be seen in the use of Malay model uh, lingualism, code switching and code mixing uh, not employed at all. Lipo's cultural and racial difference are represented at the level of non-verbal through visual cues, including costumes and setting, uh, through which the color red is dominant. So in the script itself, we have the entire setting is in, uh, dominated by the color red, right? which is an auspicious color in Chinese culture. So we have a Chinese sedan chair decorated with red cushions, a Chinese themed garden setting with Chinese bamboo, a fish pond filled with red and white lotus flowers, a rock garden in the corner. And Lipo is dressed in the style befitting a Chinese princess, and the hairstyle also follows the Chinese aristocratic fashion. When she speaks, however, we find that she's already well-versed in formal uh, court Malay. Her speech lines therefore suggest that she has, to some degree, adapted to a new country, right? and that she has mastered the language. But her refusal to let go of a Chinese identity and roots, translated through the non-verbal language of the performance itself, has contributed to the barriers between her and the people of Malacca. Hang Jaba, in fact, criticizes her resistance, arguing that she must let go of all the memories of her country of origin, melepaskan segala ingatan kepada negara asal, and and I quote, truly submit to the authority of His Majesty, or the Sultan, her husband, benar benar berajukan ke bawah duli Sultan suami. And and Lipo does submit, and the conflicted state is resolved through complete assimilation. She speaks, acts, and dresses like a Malay princess. So by examining the translational processes of interaction, or in this case, the lack of, between the verbal and non-verbal language structures of the performance, we find that the play's refusal to accommodate difference in hybridity can be said to both reflect and enact the divisive forces and cultural barriers operating among relations. This is found in the scene when Lipo launches into a sad Malay song and, quote, a la Chinese musical style, quote, a la music China. The term a la is important here. It's derived from the French a la, meaning in the style or manner of, imitation, right? And it draws our attention to this imitative dimensions operating in the performance of Chinese, but also the ways in which they're influenced by essentialized ideas and stereotypes, 
which can be seen in the cultural stereotypes operating through the setting and the costumes. Everything is red, it's red, there's the rock uh, garden, you have the lotus flowers, right, bamboo and things like that. So on the other web TV, which is the one that you're seeing now, a digital, and, and this is a, the digital portal that's watched by both educators and students, the cultural stereotypes are seen again. Right, you have red again in the opening scene. Right, you can see here in uh, Vipo's headwear, you know, with the tassels, right, and then the Chinese gown that she's wearing. Right, and in another scene, she's wearing this green two-piece and you know, the Chinese kind of clothes, very recognizable. Well, again, the, the kind of a Chinese headwear. Right, and then you have this background music, a la Chinese musical style that can be heard. Now, other stereotyped markers uh, include the classic Chinese dance, right? the fan dance. Right? And it's a staple performance that is, that is um, always done in re national representations of uh, Chinese culture. Every time there's something to, to represent the Chinese culture, they always come up with a fan dance. You know, the, the fan dance, the Chinese have, right? the, the, the women can sort of glide around the stage with the fans opening and closing. Right? So that particular dance. And then you have Lipo song which requires the actor to drag tarik and, and to hold a, like, a high note like a, in a Chinese opera style. So the casting choice, however, is also interesting because the young actor playing Li Po is Chinese while the Malay characters are performed by actors of Malay ethnicity. In contrast to the fluidity and more natural rhythms of the speech by Malay actors, the actor playing Li Po sometimes slurs and stumbles over her words an unintentional performance of non-nativeness that nonetheless marks the space of racial difference. Now, Lindsay, 2006, points out that bodies are the language, and that performativity is tied to power structures of race and ethnicity. Therefore, having a, and I quote, Malay speak Chinese on stage or vice versa is no innocent artistic choice, and quote. Different meanings can emerge from the translation between bodies and speech and performance, but when those meanings are anchored to politically charged discourses of race and ethnicity in the nation space, the performance then becomes, and I quote, a political statement entering the highly sensitive area of potential racial stereotypes, unquote. So the play's troubling performance of chinese also contradicts the lived reality of Malaysian Chinese identities, which, as I pointed out earlier, are constantly evolving and adapting to both local and global conditions. By endorsing the full assimilation of the Chinese minority as the desired outcome, Putri ultimately shows the lack of negotiation between monolithic, state-defined notions of chinese and the ongoing transformation and hybridization of Malaysian Chinese on the ground, revealing in the process gaps and cracks between the ethnic communities, or indeed how little they know of or even understand each other. It is at the level of the subtext that the play ironically taps into this profound sense of loss and displacement experienced by Malaysian Chinese, whose racialized and feminized position as non lumi Putra other is also one that is upheld in national curriculum and taught across the country. However, the Chinese characters are not the only ones being essentialized here. The imagining and representation of Malay identity are also influenced by an idealized past found in the pages of Sejara Melayu, a text supported by the state as an authoritative source of Malay Muslim identity, culture, and history. According to Nagata 2011, and I quote, Malay culture and identity are a product of centuries of hybridization, unquote. It is marked by diversity, multiplicity, and fluidity. And Malayness is an evolving and hybrid identity. And in Malaysia, it has a history of you know, uh, contact uh, and influence from Indian, Arabic, Chinese, and regional sources, including from Indonesia. Not to mention the changes and transformations engendered by generations of intermarriage and intermingling with other races and cultures. It is only after independence in 1957 that a more rigid concept of Malayness was adopted. As Nagata again notes, the, quote, the official range of uh, expression of Malayness is now one of the narrowest in history. Unquote. So based on essentialized ideas of race and ethnicity, albeit in differing ways, the play highlights not just the problematic construction of identity in the nation states, but also the manner in which they reinforce notions of and perspectives on race and ethnicity as historicized in discourses in the shaping of Malaysia as a modern nation state. So now let's go to the second thing. Sorry. 
going backwards. Right, this one. So unlike Rama's play, Anne Lee's play has only been performed three times before live audiences in 1998. All right, and it was only published in 2011. It was never adopted you know, uh, or incorporated into the national curriculum. Um, and basically, very few people even you know, remember it, to tell the truth. All right, um, so deconstructing the Chinese princess in critical ways, the postmodernist monodrama Hang Li Po, Malacan Princess, which I'll shorten to princess, is at once subversive in as much as it is new and exciting in a celebration of multiplicity, hybridity, and difference. Now, notably, Li Po is recognized as a Malacan princess, right? A description that stresses her Malacan or Malaysian identity rather than her ethnicity. Other popular ideas about the princess are also unsettled when she refuses to stay put in Malacca or the 15th century. Instead, she travels across time and space to different parts of the world. Right. So the play actually deconstructs you know, this temporal, spatial, and uh, linguistic boundaries, and they are all blurred right? as the character traverses past and present, as well as multiple locations and languages. There are, interestingly, eight versions of the princess in the play, which makes her identity rich and multiple. So drawing on the differences based on age, class, location, occupation, and status, the play conveys the different identities via the title of each of the eight scenes. She is princess, courtesan, instrument of, of trade, child bride, warrior, tourist guide, astronaut, and finally, migrant. Now, each scene also functions as a critical commentary on the politics of language, race, and gender in society, both in the past and the present. Now, what's interesting here? Sorry, let me stay here first. Now, what's interesting here is that the entire play is a monodrama, so it's performed only by one actor who plays all eight versions of Hang Li Po, all right? And it showcases, therefore, this idea of, and I quote, multilingualism in one body. Now, this particular concept was actually coined by Christian Jib, a very prominent uh, director and uh, playwright in, in Malaysia. Uh, he's passed away, sadly. All right. And it involves basically the body's familiarity with multiple languages and the different physical embodiments such as code mixing, code switching, bilingualism, and multilingualism. Right. Remember what I said earlier on Malaysians are Rojak people, right? We all grew up with this facility for language, uh, multiple languages, right, due to our daily communication and interaction. So this multilingual performance is can be seen as kind of a, a theater of resistance that not only critiques the politics of race and ethnicity, but also challenges the homogenizing forces of Malay, Malay monoculturalism as the only representation of national culture. The concept of multilingualism in one body is dramatized from scene three onwards. So in this scene, the cultural hybridity of the third version of Hang Li Po is spotlighted when she speaks in impeccable Queen's English. Right? And I put Li in saying Queen's English. In fact, this is a reference to Malacan's Peranakan Chinese community who, during the British occupation, embraced the English language and culture and actually regarded themselves as the Queen's subjects. So they were, they were very much into the English culture. And in doing so, the play undermines the state-defined notion of identity as static and fixed, suggesting instead that identity is subject to flux, to change and transformation, which is more reflective of the reality of evolving Malaysian Chinese identities. So in the next few scenes, the individual body's culturally hybrid and distinctly Malaysian identity, right? It's also seen when the actor has this ability to speak and code switch between four different languages. Right? She can speak English, Malay, Mandarin, and Cantonese, and she's just, you know, weaves in and out between them. So English is the dominant linguistic code of the play, but there are two scenes where the actor switches to Malay, Cantonese, and Mandarin. Now, when she does so, subtitles in English and Malay are brought in whenever the dialogue lines are in Cantonese or Mandarin and sometimes bilingual code mixing between English and Malay is used. Now, the actor also performs English in different accents in several scenes. She uses Queen in the Queen's English, there's Malayu, refined and rough, there's Malaysian Chinese accent, there's a Bostonian accent, Sydney neutral, and the last region. 
Now, the strategic use of translation and subtitles affirm the power hierarchies among languages, with Cantonese placed at the bottom of the linguistic hierarchy. It is the only language that requires translated subtitles in both English and Malay. This is because Cantonese is a Chinese dialect, while Mandarin is the medium of instruction in Chinese vernacular schools and the language by which Chinese learners is often defined. However, the use of English as the dominant code reflects the politics of the performance, which, situation, uh, which uh, situates itself firmly within an English-speaking urban and cosmopolitan Malaysian as well as international audience and setting. So in the reversal of power positions, Malay is not only secondary in princess, it is actively resisted against, even destabilized. This can be seen in scene 5, when the play makes fun of formal Malay discourse, which represents official Malay uh, used during state functions and in the media. So title warrior, the scene depicts the fifth version of Hang Po in a showdown with legendary Malay woman warrior Tun Fatima who in Malaysian history was the fifth wife of Sultan Mahmud in the 16th century. So both the characters are engaged in a tense dance, and Tang Lipo is performing the Wushu dance, and um, we have uh, uh, Tun Fatima performing the uh, Silat. Right? So they are conducting this kind of uh, war dance, and they are conducting a verbal exchange at the same time in their respective mother tongues. So Hang Lipo uh, speaks in formal Mandarin, speaks court Malay with English subtitles used for both. However, the way the subtitles are used are unsettling because the translation and the quote Enli, uh, Enli's direction uh, is contemporary and informal, disconcerting and or comic, unquote. For instance, when Tun Fatima uses a rhyme the quatrain to address uh, Hang Lipo, right? The Giri Kakanda Rumpun Nusantara, the Nama Bakmur, the English subtitles, however, state, so how? So how? Right. So then there's that irreverent subtitle. What's the diff? When Tun Fatima asks, Papa Bezan here, Pada Adinda. So what's the difference? It's more formal. And you know, there's this irreverence in the play of subtitles. So to the Malaysian audience who could understand the complex interplay between Malay and English, the out-of-sync meanings emerging from the in-between space of utterance and translation, while disconcerting, are nonetheless a timely reminder of how the journey, and I quote Alfian uh, Sa'at, a Singaporean playwright in 2006, the journey of a sign from source to target language involves an imposition, unquote, just like how the state discourse of language and race have been imposed upon the plural society. Therefore, the strategic use of bad translation can serve the crucial purpose, and I quote Alfian again, of empowering the audience member into examining cultural incompatibilities and political incongruities present in the social reality. The audience's ability to pick up and translate the different linguistic codes is also important to the interpretation of the play. According to Lindsay 2006, a multilingual performance can, and I quote, create communities of understanding and non-understanding which can validate and challenge an audience's sense of communal, and co uh, sorry, audience's communal sense as cosmopolitan or as part of the nation, I quote. So as post-1969 Malaysians have developed this kind of compartmentalized uh, mentality as the Putra or non Putra, Watching a multilingual performance might be challenging, even discomforting, an experience that mirrors to an extent the disjunctions and divisions among Malaysia's ethnolinguistic communities. And so I will conclude. The different appropriations and revisions of the legendary princess tell us a story of racial and cultural ironies, incongruities, and disjunctions that are anchored in ideological disparities. Putri translates the legend according to the hegemonic state imperatives of monoculturalism and monolingualism, through which the idea of Malay Malaysia undergoes the construction of the nation. In this translation, difference and hybridity become lost, effectively excluded or erased from the narrative. Princess, on the other hand, employs the idea of multilingualism in one body to express a very different vision of Malaysia as a nation, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multicultural. So while Rahma employs key symbols and figures of Malay history, culture, and language to represent the glorious past of the Malaccan Sultanate, Lee 
reconstructs the legend and history and moving forward into the future to embrace modern Malaysia, one that is connected to the new Asia diaspora, transnationalism, and globalization. And in the process, the textuality of history is made emphatic, as are the many ways in which it is subjected to the politics of appropriation, to manipulation, and to revision. Now this phenomenon, this politics of appropriation, manipulation, and revision, is not only seen in Malaysia, but also in Indonesia. Indeed, there are notable similarities between the appropriation of Ang Liko and that of another princess, one very well known here. Raden Hajan Kartini. I'm sure you all know her, right? Kartini. Alright, so if you're interested in the analysis I've offered today, please, you know, we have this uh, forthcoming volume on appropriating Kartini, which actually maps, you know, um, Dutch colonials, Indonesian state, UNESCO, Eleanor Roosevelt, to show how Kartini has been appropriated across the ages from colonial, national, and transnational and how her memory was subjected to political agendas and contestations occurring at key moments. All right, and it will be out next year. All right, thank you everyone. So if you have any questions, we have any questions. Would you like to watch a bit of the video on uh, Hang Lipo on EduWeb TV? Because yeah. I have it here. And you can hear how it is before. So this is the opening scene of uh, Putri. So you see the Chinese fan dance again, right? Okay, I'll stop here.
Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Professor Grace Jim, for your wonderful elaboration on um, Malaysianization of a Chinese princess in Malaysia. Uh, it sounds so familiar. Looks like Indonesia, uh, many co-optation of uh, cultural heritage being uh, co-opted and have to follow one model of uh, dominant culture, and it happens to her. Um, but do you think it is as a survival, or there is no choice? Uh, and then, that's Sorry, not a, is, is a survival for Survival for her, people. Uh, oh, at the end that she submits to the, the, the Sultan? Yeah. Yes, definitely is a survival. <laughs> I don't think she has any choice. I mean, in the legend itself, she, I mean, she had no say in the marriage, right? The, the soul of the way she was just basically given away. And we never hear her you know, express her opinion on anything. You know, it's just a story that she was sent to Malacca and the Sultan saw her and was greatly impressed by her beauty. And then, you know, and, and after conversion, and, and got married and had children, that's it. You know? yeah. so, so in some ways, Rama tries to address the gender aspects, you know, because she gives voice to the princess, right? She gives voice, at least some kind of voice. But at the end, if she was rebellious in the beginning, you know, she was resistant to all that. By the end, all that is gone. The very final scene of Hang Li Po, the, the last lines, are not spoken by her at all. She, she remains very quiet. And it is the, the last lines are actually all spoken by the Sultan. So the, the play itself actually conforms to the, the, the narrative, the, the, the plot line of the genre. Thank you very much. Students, do you have any questions? I'd be happy to hear from you. <laughs> study of Han Lipo. So what is your belief from this one? Han Lipo is a myth or maybe there's a story or a history just like Kartini. Kartini we have many uh, many facts that uh, this exists. But mm. what about Han Lipo? Thank you. Oh, thank you for the question. Well at least we know Kartini is real, right? <laughs> Han Lipo for me, uh, she is a, a legend. She does not exist. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because Sejara Malayu actually, you know, it brings in fictional elements. You know, like Oputri Gunung Leda. She's mythical. You know, she doesn't really exist. All right, so we do have mythical elements that have been woven into, um, into Sejara Malayu. Uh, and there are no records whatsoever uh, in, the, in the Ming Dynasty records. You know? uh, this was done by Jeffrey Wade in 1997. And he, he combed through the records, the Imperial Ming records, which actually contains a lot of details, in, including the voyage of, of uh, Admiral Cheng Ho, uh, Zheng He, right? Uh, Admiral Cheng Ho, who sailed to Southeast Asia, right? And I think he even came to uh, Indonesia, right? Uh, so, so there are records of him, his trips, but there's no record whatsoever about this Chinese princess, Hang Li Po. So that's the reason why, you know, um, Professor Ku said that uh, she's uh, mythical, she doesn't exist. But it, was, uh, it caused quite a bit of controversy in Malaysia at the time because you know, our, the students were studying about her in history textbooks. So basically, you know, uh, he's saying that um, you know, we need to revise our entire history syllabus, basically. Yeah. Yeah. 
Tragically, uh, because it's taught, it's taught in schools as history. Yeah. So students believe that they have such kind of princess <laughs> That's becoming right. uh, confirmed to to China uh, to Malaysia. That's right. That's right. Oh, thank you so much for this. Um, not opening. at all. And in fact, if I may share with you, yeah. Hang Lipu is not the only you know legend uh, legendary figure that was actually you know made into historical figure. Uh, Hang Tua is another one. And Hang Tua, because I, I think I showed you um, just now that page, let me just go back up to it. Um, the very first part here. This one. This is actually from an, an actual history uh, textbook. Let me see what comes up. Yeah, yeah. This one. This is actually from the, the, the history textbook. And it shows Hang Tua, you know, uh, and, it, and it lists out is his attributes that he is uh, what is Mahir Ilmu Pesilatan. Is it Pesilatan? Yes. He's skilled in martial arts, right? And he is very loyal. That's the, that's the thing about Hang Tua that we remember of. We, we hear about Hang Tua is he's a very loyal warrior, loyal to the king, so much so that he kills his own best friend. And then he's very brave and then he's very smart. So, and, and uh, this is what is being you know, taught to our, our students here in, in Malaysia. And there are even museums you know, that claim that Hang Tua is a real figure. So when, when Kuki Kim came out and said, look, it really caused a, quite a controversy in Malaysia. One last question. Yeah, um, sure. um, being a historian in Malaysia, mm. uh, does it not jeopardize your life? I mean, it's, in mm -hmm. Indonesia, I won't be able to do that, you know, you be considered as anti-government and probably a PKI. Uh, uh, so how is it in Malaysia? Was, yeah, but I think Kuki Kim was uh, very old at the time, he's already retired. <laughs> and he's a very, actually, a uh, uh, well-known, uh, prominent uh, uh, historian in Malaysia. So, uh, I think he was just sharing his concern. And of course, there were rebuttals, you know, the king said no, that he's wrong, and you know, there's this kind of debate that was going on. And I think that's that's quite good. I mean, it's quite healthy because you know what actually is going on in our history textbooks. What kind of messages are being conveyed to us, and what are we learning about our nation, right? So it is good that he put it out there. But it's not the first time that our history textbooks have, have come under scrutiny. Uh, another one was the promotion of Sejarah Malayu as a historical text. Whereas it's actually a historical literary text, right? It's not a source of all history because, as I mentioned, there are you know characters in there that we know are not real. Yeah. Uh, a thought uh, comes with this is that um, the remaking of history mm. is, uh, I think, it's only in Indonesia, but it also happens in Malaysia. Uh, in Indonesia you'd be thought as being subversive and anti-government. Um, but for the sake of intellectuality and being scholars, uh, you have to do that and see everything in different angles. So right. thank you so much for your right. lecture. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Does anyone have? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for your lecture. It's very inspiring and enlightening in some ways. Uh, I have a question about translation itself. Mm -hmm. Do you sure. find cases of uh, word for word or uh, level sentence uh, sentence level translation, mm -hmm. which are uh, which has variations mm -hmm. uh, according to the audience, yeah. uh, from the source language to the target language? 
because I'm studying right now about uh, translation uh, around uh, Arabic, Russian, and uh, some Persian words. Yeah. And uh, because the target language is Russian speakers, they need to um, to find uh, words <coughs> closest to the uh, audience, and yeah. that creates a problem because, uh, well, you know, translations uh, can lead to um, conflict in some yeah. cases. Yeah. So, uh, do you find that in Lipo's um, Annalise and Rahma's plays? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a very good question because you're talking about the very traditional kind of. Translation process, right? And something is invariably lost. However, translation studies have actually moved away from that more kind of conventional uh, area because now it's looking at cultural translation. How do you translate culturally, right? And how do you do so without, um, you know, uh, injecting your own. Um, ideas or meanings into it because it's subjected to interpretation. The person translating it ultimately has to interpret it. Am I right? right? So it is subjected to interpretation. So there will always be, there will never be a kind of actual equivalence of meaning. I don't think we can ever do that. You know, because culturally, you know, culture to culture, there's certain words and meanings that cannot be found. In other cultures that may be, may be found in ours, we you know, like uh, in, in English, we have one word love, and it, it, it encompasses everything, right? Whether it's family love, fatherly love, or parental love, and all. But here, you know, in Malay, we can say uh, sayang, cinta, kase, they might have different, different meanings. So, how do we translate that? So, something will be lost. So, we are actually now broadening the horizon of translation studies by looking at you know, cultural translation, performance translation, in different, different ways, looking at how uh, translation becomes a strategy to interpret and also to, not just in terms of interpretation, but also the kind of politics that the interpreter may carry, you know, while translating. And because we may have certain, you know, uh, arguments to make. So these are things that we have to consider as well. But, for sure, we can never have an exact equivalence in meaning. I hope that answers answer the question. Well, uh, it does answer the question, but it brings uh, another uh, problem with it. Because mm -hmm. um, when we talk uh, in legal uh, texts, mm -hmm. there needs to be a, re a certain translation of word for word. Because mm -hmm. we are living in a globalized world. Mm -hmm. And the internet right now has becoming uh, is becoming a problem mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to legal uh, context mm -hmm. because uh, transnational um, laws uh, and security mm -hmm. and rule of laws needs to be translated and I think that's uh, something uh, we are that's true. in the progress of. Uh, yeah, I wish version are you into, Yeah, I wish version I could use and things like that, right? Because we all have different. So again, it must be adapted, I think, ultimately to the, you know, um, to the closest approximation, you know. But th that's what my volume, actually, the edited volume that I'm working on, actually addresses these kinds of issues as well. But we're not just looking at translation at, at the linguistic level. We're actually looking at cultural, post-colonial translations, theater translations, different kinds of translation that involve the, you know, um, the interpretation and meaning message, representation, right? And how it occurs, right? So, but it does address that, the idea that something is lost. <laughs> does anyone else have any question? Not then, we may can. Thank you everyone for, you know, uh, being here and, and, and you yeah. And thank you for your questions. And uh, now we would like to give you a token of appreciation from our university.